panel um, at half 10. Um, now, whenever we invite peer speakers, we ask them to share their warts and all journey. Um, and that's just because we want to be completely honest and transparent about what it is like taking on social investment. Um, we'll take a quick comfort break um, after that. Um, we will do um, a Q&A on social investment in practice, um, how, how it works, what it's like in real life. Um, and then we'll do a quick Mentimeter check again and, and see whether they sort of knowledge um, levels have, have changed over the course um, of our conversation. Um, at uh, around uh, 12, we will um, open up with some optional networking. Um, really lovely to stay and connect and chat to people if you can, um, but it is optional, so you have other things to be getting to and you can um, drop off and then we will um, wrap up around um, half 12. Um, so uh, without further ado, um, I guess um, I will, I will uh, lead us into the next session, um, which is on what social investment is. Um, and I should start by saying um, that good finance is what we call uh, user-led um, and our users are charities and social enterprises. So even though we're sort of backed and funded by Big Society Capital and Access, um, our goal and mission um, is to be completely independent and autonomous and to be the trusted place for information on social investment for charities and social enterprises. Um, and what that means is, is that we work um, to, to make sure that we're giving you as much relevant and accurate um, and realistic information as we possibly can. Um, and if actually you come to the end of this session today and decide that social investment is not for me, um, that is completely okay. And we still consider that a job done. Um, what we always say about social investment is that it's one of the tools in your toolbox, might not be the right tool for the job, but it's an important tool to know about. Um, Emily, will you take me over onto the next slide? So I won't um, talk too much about this because we've got um, a, a lovely little video which we'll play you in a second. But um, in, in essence, um, social investment is repayable finance. And so that's just really important to, to keep in mind is that um, it's, not, it's not like grant money and it is repayable. Um, and charities and social enterprises um, who are generating a surplus through trading activities um, or through contracts, grants and donations um, may take on uh, social investment. Um, again, go, going back to my thing about social investment being one of the tools, and um, we very much recognize that there are other income sources um, and social, social investment often for organizations is one that sits alongside a whole bunch of other things like contracts, grants um, and trading. Um, but, but where there is trading or profit or surplus, um, it can then be used to repay uh, investors um, and uh, social investment very much sits alongside all of the other tools in the financial toolbox. Um, so Emily, will you play the, the video for us? Across the UK, charities and social enterprises like yours are tackling some of society's biggest problems. Maybe you've set up a coffee business to give people the skills to get back into work, or are running a nursery and using the profits to support local parents. Whatever your mission, you'll need money to help with cash flow, to grow your organisation, or to buy an asset like a new building. You might even need finance to kickstart your new venture. And that money could come from traditional grants or donations, or as a loan from your local bank. One option is to get that money from a social investor. That social investor could be an organisation or an individual, and you can borrow their money or offer them shares in your organisation. But what makes a social investor different? Well, they don't just want to see a return on their investment. They want to see their money being used for good, helping you to keep delivering your social mission. Sound good? To see if it's right for you, check out goodfinance.org.uk. So yeah, a very, very simple um, explanation of how social investment works. Um, it's worth keeping in mind that it's quite often not actually that simple. There are lots of different um, types of social investment. There are lots of different investors all over the country investing into different things. Um, one of the easiest ways, I think, to explain social, finding a social investor or taking on social investment is it's a bit like dating. 
uh, you've got to get get out there you've got to meet some people you've got to talk to some people um and only then can you can you figure out when sort of your your, your values and your missions um, align. The interesting thing to know about social investors though, and, and we did a bit of audit on the Good Finance um, website is, so we have an investor directory that has around a hundred social investors um, listed on there. And the vast majority of social investors in the UK are themselves registered charities and social enterprises. So I think it was over 85% of the investors we had listed on the directory were themselves social enterprises and charities. Um, and, and that means that they, um, you know, they, they really do care about both the social impact that they're having as well as the financial return that they're getting. Um, you know, one of the reasons that social investment exists is because social enterprises and charities are just dealing with some of the most challenging issues in the UK. Um, and I have no doubt that that is going to be even more true in the coming years. Um, and social investment is the use of repayable finance to help an organisation achieve a social purpose. Um, Emily, will you hop onto the next slide? So in an ideal world, social investment wouldn't need to exist. We'd have enough grant money to go around for everyone. Um, but it's, as we know, <laughs> very much not an ideal world. Um, but what the research does show us is that a third of charities um, say that funding is the most important tool that's needed to help the sector increase its impact. Um, around a quarter of charities um, have set up trading subsidiaries showing the move towards more commercial models. Um, and we know that the social enterprise space has been going for some years as well. Um, but 43% say that access to finance is one of the biggest obstacles in sustainability and growth. Um, and that's referring to grant debt and equity um, finance. Um, which is really interesting um, when you think about it, because we know that more and more charities and social enterprises um, are starting out to tackle some of the world's biggest issues, and yet access to funding remains one of the biggest barriers. Um, and, and that's where social investment comes in, is it's one of those funding tools to be aware of. Um, next slide. Um, so over the course um, of, of the pandemic, um, it's been really well, it's been really telling to see, see what's been happening. Um, UK charities, it's estimated, are facing a 10 billion funding gap um, as a result of the pandemic. Um, incomes are expected to drop by 6.7 billion, um, but the demand for, for charity and social enterprise support continues to increase by quite a significant amount. Um, for some organisations that have been really adversely affected um, over the past year, social lending has the potential to be to be a lifeline and, and to be a really helpful tool um, during this time, especially for demand, if demand for their services continue. Um, outside of the context of pan the pandemic and just thinking a bit sort of, you know, stepping back in the big picture, um, social impact investing uh, in the UK has grown sixfold um, over the past eight years. Um, it's increased from somewhere around 800 million um, to over 5 billion in 2019. Um, so it is a very much growing space, the kind of the, the lending that's happening in that space. Um, we've thrown a lot of big numbers at you today, but it's also really worth keeping in mind that actually the average investment that organisations are looking for and um, what they're looking for is sort of social investment that is patient, that is affordable, um, and that is risk bearing and the average demand that we see um, starts at sort of £50,000 and um, so we throw in a lot of big numbers but actually the, the average amounts um, start at sort of about £50,000. £50, um, so yeah that's just a bit more about the sort of context um, of social investment and where it sits in the UK market today. Um, what we'll do over the course of today's conversation um, is just kind of um, hear those stories come to life and um, because as I said there's lots of different types of social investment and lots of different reasons why organisations take it and hopefully we'll bring those um, to life uh, for you today. Um, so I'm just going to quickly check am I doing all right on time Emily? Yeah, awesome. Will you take me over onto the next slide then? So, um, seven lessons learned, um, and I'm sure some of these will come to life um, over the course of today's conversation as well. Um, we've been we've been running Let's Talk Good Finance events for a couple of years now, and I think we've probably 
oh, I wouldn't want to guess, but I'd say we're like close to having done a hundred of them. And, and we speak to lots of different people that have taken on social investment. Um, and these are sort of the key lessons um, that we've learned from speaking to people um, who have been there and done it. Um, so the first one is that social investment is not benevolent money. Really important to keep that in mind that it's it's not grant money. You do have to pay it back. And more often than not, you have to pay it back with interest. Um, it's really worth keeping in that mind that you have to be at a stage in your organisational journey um, that you can realistically take on social investment and pay it back. Um, the good news is, though, is that it's, you know, it's in no social investor's best interest to take on or invest into an organisation that can't pay them back. And if you do look at it, this is something that your social investor will work with you on is, is making sure that, that you're able to kind of make that financial commitment. Um, the second one is impact really matters. Um, like I said, most social investors are themselves charities and social enterprises. Um, and when you're working with and talking to them, they will absolutely be looking um, at the impact that you're making. So really important to be able to communicate the impact. Um, what's also important, though, is to measure what matters to you, um, not what you think you could or should be measuring for, for investors or for funders. Um, that's, that's a really important lesson is measure what matters to you. Um, it's about so much more than the money. Um, so social, social investors, uh, the repayment terms will be over a period of years. Um, and it is about so much more than the money because you're getting into a relationship with an investor, really. Um, and never has that been more true than in the past year where we've seen kind of social investors um, adapt and, and tailor and kind of, you know, really, really try and meet the needs of the organisations that they're investing into, um, especially in the context of the pandemic. Um, we saw a lot of social investors um, kind of just move uh, to, to work with um, the organisations that they'd invested into. Um, honesty is always the best policy. So if you don't know, if you're struggling, um, communicate communicate that with a potential investor or whoever's supporting you through the process. Um, it is a space where there's a lot of jargon, there's a lot of buzzwords. Um, it's entirely okay if you don't know what they all mean. Um, we actually have something on Good Finance called the Jargon Buster, which explains all of the different um, types of words and acronyms that you might hear. Um, why isn't it cheaper if, if it's social? So this is one that we get asked a lot is, um, if social investment is about the social impact, why do you have to pay it back? Why do you have to pay it with interest? And why aren't those interest rates cheaper than they are? Um, and there's lots of different answers and it's, it's, it's a complex thing. But in, in essence, um, social investment is like a replenishing pot. So the money that you pay back eventually goes to being able to support or fund another charity or social en enterprise. And like grant money, it's a pot that doesn't run out because it keeps getting reinvested back into. Um, in terms of the interest rates and how they're set, um, they will be different from investor to investor. But what investors need, really need to consider is what their entire portfolio looks like and what risk looks like for them. And interest rates will be covering the cost of, of the investor to, to lend that money in the first place, but also the risk that the investor is taking on. Now, something that's really worth keeping in mind is that you may completely find cheaper options out on the high street or with high street banks. Um, and we always suggest that people really do their research and speak to everyone that's an option before they kind of um, to, to take on social investment. But something else that we find is that quite often high street banks just don't quite get charity and social enterprise business models or it's um, there, there's a risk level that they're not willing to take. So quite often organizations that take on social investment won't be able to find that capital elsewhere. Um, due diligence isn't fun, but it does make your business better. So due diligence is essentially the process that you would go on with a social investor where they would really look at your organization, your accounts, the way that it all works um, before they lent you money. Really important process to, to go on. And um, to be honest, if you've, if you've ever applied for a significant sum of grant money, uh, you're more than equipped to be able to go through the due diligence process as well. Um, and it always takes longer than you think. So this is what we say is don't, don't leave it until you absolutely need it to take on social investment. Um, just it, the process always takes longer than you think. So get started before you think you might need it. Um, 
so yeah, ho- hopefully you'll see more of those things um, coming coming to life over the course of today's conversation. Um, I'm just going to quickly um, share a couple of case studies and a couple of examples um, before we move on, um, and I will hand you back over to, to Emily for the. So. Great. So thank you so much um, for, um, for that great uh, session, Ashita, just giving us a little flavour of what social investment is. And please, if you have any questions, do feel free to pop them into, into the chat. We do have time for networking at the end where you can ask any other questions that you might have um, of Ashita or, or of anyone who was on uh, this session today. And like Ashita mentioned at the start of this session, um, the real reason why we put on Let's Talk Good Finance events is because we want to hear from organisations who have taken on social investment themselves, who have really been on a journey of um, starting that process. And we are delighted to have some fantastic here from a peer speakers joining uh, the session today. So first up, I would like to invite uh, Holly Cross to take the virtual floor. Um, Holly is the um, Director and Development Project Manager at Care Area Renewable Energy Limited and we are really delighted to have you um, Holly at this session today so I will let you um, take the floor and thank you very much for joining us. Thank you Emily and thanks Ashita. I actually learned quite a lot from that <laughs> from that session about what's this social investment even though I'm probably about to tell you about how we've uh, we've taken part in that. Um, so yeah, as, as Emily said, my name's Holly. Um, I'm a director of Cum Ariane Renewable Energy, or CARE for short. We're a community benefit society. Um, we were constituted around about 10, well, it's 10 years ago this September. Um, uh, we're based in North Pembrokeshire, right in the west of Wales. Uh, so we've got the same weather as Cornwall today, which is can't see anything. Um, but we haven't got the police presence, which is quite reassuring. <laughs> um, so uh, our... Our Community Benefit Society, essentially, its core aims is to create a low carbon economy and to reduce poverty in our area of North Pembrokeshire. Um, we were initially constituted in order to sort of enable us to put up a wind turbine. Well, initially, we wanted to put up two wind turbines in our local area. So the sort of financial story of that is that we were we were initially just a group of volunteers with an interest in renewable energy that, that could be owned by the community instead of seeing um, our landscape sort of being being you know, used for things like wind turbines and and all of that investment and all of that profit just leaving um, leaving the area and not benefiting the community at all. So um, we initially applied for a little bit of grant money to look at the feasibility of, of, doing, of doing something like erecting a wind turbine or making a solar park. Um, and that feasibility study indicated that wind energy was the, was the most feasible way of making an income for the community from sale of green electricity. So we benefited over, over the following years from um, the Welsh government's energy service, which had various iterations and the Avro was one of the names, which means sort of um, energy of the of the of our area, of our local area. Um, now, the, the Welsh Government Energy Service is kind of an advisory and support service, but they also had preparatory grants, which meant that we benefited from, in the end, a couple of hundred thousand pounds um, over a period of years of these preparatory grants, which which eliminated all of the risk for us. So those preparatory grants took us through the planning process, essentially. Um, so paid for all of the studies and the drawings and the planning fees and the yeah all of the sort of ecology surveys that we needed to do to to show the local authority that they should allow us to put up a wind turbine um, or two in our local area for community benefit. Um, it was a rather torturous process. So thank goodness for the Welsh Government Energy Service and those preparatory grants because we could have been two hundred thousand pounds out of pocket and with nothing to show for it. And it took us almost a decade in the end um, to, to get planning in the end from Welsh Government to the inspectorate, not from local authority level. Um, but through that process, yes, we got these preparatory grants. But we also got a temporary loan from Welsh Government, which is just a very short period loan in order to enable us to buy some of the wind turbine kits that was that we needed to buy in a hurry because uh, we were running out of time. And we also benefited from a low interest um, sort of 
I don't know if this is the right term, but a sort of a, a no strings attached loan from a community bank, the Robert Owen Community Bank in um, in North Wales, um, which we wouldn't have had to have paid back if we didn't get the um, if we didn't get the planning. We did get the planning, so we did pay it back with a little bit of interest. So, as the shooter was explaining, that kind of paid back into the pot of that social investor um, in the early days of our experience. So, having got to that stage of having planning and having bought those important bits of kit. We then needed uh, a serious injection of finance as um, putting up just one um, sort of medium scale wind turbine, it's a 700 kilowatt turbine, um, required over a million pounds, which was a very scary prospect for a group of a band of sort of jolly volunteers from the local area. <laughs> None of us, you know, professional um, engineers or uh, anything, you know, our backgrounds were, were very varied. Um, we, you know, we have, we have sort of social entrepreneurs in, in a very sort of gentle sense among, amongst us in the directorship, but we're kind of farmers and educators. Um, we're not, we're, we're not used to investing so much, so much money in, in, in assets. However, we found through a little bit of exploration with the handholding, thanks to um, uh, the Welsh Government Energy Service, to their advisors, we explored Triodos, we explored other high street banks um, and due to the time it took us to get the planning, the, the guarantee of the feed-in tariff, which was essentially going to be what made us the profit through this, through sale of electricity, had reduced and reduced and reduced to the point where the profit wasn't negligible, but it wasn't huge. Um, so we didn't find it particularly feasible to go to the high street to, to invest in, in, this, in this wind turbine project. But we were confident um, that it was going to be worth doing, that even if it was just five to ten thousand pounds a year coming back to the community, that was better than nothing. Because, you know, five to ten thousand pounds for your community hall and your young farmers club is nothing to be sniffed at. So we turned to uh, the Development Bank of Wales, which is the Welsh government lending arm, essentially. And, and through, as she to explain, that very long-winded and rather torturous, difficult process of due diligence, um, we were offered a £1.3 million loan at 5% interest rate over 20 years. Um, it's a secured loan, so because it's, uh, because it's secured by the asset of the wind turbine. Um, it was, yeah, it was challenging. And I'm, I think if it hadn't been for Development Bank of Wales being sort of such an understanding, social, socially motivated investor, we wouldn't, we almost certainly wouldn't have done it. Um, because, yeah, it was rather alien to us, really. The spreadsheet we had to fill out, <laughs> the due diligence spreadsheet was incredible. And all of that at the same time was entering into a, what appeared to us a hugely complex um, sort of lease, uh, a legal arrangement with the, with the turbine suppliers, with the landowner, and then of course with the investor as well. But we did it. And in 2019, that wind turbine was put up on the hill and since then has been turning happily in the lovely windy weather of Pembrokeshire and has been meeting the targets, uh, the financial targets that we, we projected. Um, and we've been happily paying back that loan since, since day one. Um, the feed-in tariff is, is, is pretty small. Um, the, the profit at the moment, we're still kind of learning how to do all our financial projections really thoroughly, but it's certainly paying itself back and it's allowing us to employ um, one part-time um, sort of project manager um, and is also looking like it's going to allow us to sort of reinvest into some more staff time to do more work in our community to meet those aims of creating a low carb economy and, and reducing fuel poverty. I mean, and again, sort of, obviously we're talking about finance. I think one of the things that going through that difficult uh, learning curve process of getting the loan has, has taught us, well, has given to us is confidence because um, since putting the turbine up, we've really felt able to um, broaden our horizons, I suppose. And we are now looking at refinancing um, at a lower interest rate. So we've just found out that the local authority is offering loans, social investment, at a lower rate, looking at around about two or three percent. Um, so we're just in conversation with them 
about refinancing some of the Development Bank of Wales loan with that lower interest loan from a more local pot, which actually is, feels feels really comfortable to us. Um, we are also looking, at which, we, which is something we've always hoped to do, at refinancing by share offer. So allowing local people to invest in, in the asset itself and be part of our cooperative in a much more active sort of membership way and benefit from it financially. Um, that's in question at the moment, because if we can get such a low interest loan at two or three percent from from the local authority, we're not sure whether people will be attracted by a share offer where they only get sort of two or three percent back themselves. But we're going to cross that bridge when we come to it. We were discussing this last night in our board meeting um, because I think socially for us, it's really important that local people feel um part of this project and, and, and can invest in it and benefit from it and, and take some ownership over it. So that's, the, that's the initial um, idea of our, of our whole project. So as I said, we've been able to, um, we feel much more confident now around social, around investment at all. You know, we've been grant funded for so long and in the process of putting up the wind turbine, we got some further grant money, some European grant money to, to do some more kind of community-based work around sort of support and education, which looks at um, uh, environmental as well as social impact of sort of community activity. And in the last 12 months, we've started um, a couple of other projects which you know focus very much on landscape restoration um, education uh, around nature and well-being our well-being and also restoration of habitat for improved biodiversity that's really our passion project at the moment again though this is all about grant funding i mean you'll see on the picture uh, that um, that, you're, that emily's showing there we've we've had lots and lots of different funders from welsh government to the um, the national lottery and waterloo foundation um, so we've, we're, we're much more used to having grant funding, but as Ashita pointed out, if you can fill out a complex grant application, you can fill out uh, any kind of due diligence application for, for social investment. I would definitely, definitely echo that. Um, although uh, one of the things that Ashita said was that, you know, it'd be great if there was enough grant funding to go around and social investment didn't have to be. <laughs> but I'd argue that actually... For us, so the social investment, the, the process of getting a loan and knowing we have to pay it back has actually been really empowering for us. And it's I'm not saying that grant money is free money, but a loan is, I don't know, you almost have to, you have to be more innovative and creative around how you generate the income which you know you're going to have to pay back and and that you know you're paying back into a social investor that then will will benefit others so it really it really makes your own organization's impact a bit broader and it certainly it certainly has made us more creative um, and on the back of this project I was just mentioning, which is grant funded, which is about lands landscape restoration. In the last year, we've identified several areas um, locally where we feel we could um, create, uh, generate sort of services and create products which still meet our social aims of, of improving the environment, creating this low carbon economy, reducing poverty, of creating jobs as well, um, but, but do it in an enterprising way so that we create a sustainable income for ourselves and we don't have to rely on, on grant money anymore or even social investment. We'll see, that, that may be a little bit ambitious sort of 10 year plan. But at the moment, we've just benefited from um, another Welsh government sort of social investment um, project called Third Sector Resilience Fund, where we've got a blend of grant and loan of around about £80,000, 20% of which is a loan, um, which will be paid back. Well, it, it can be paid back over 10 years. The first two years are actually interest free. So that was really attractive to us. It's not the 1.3 million that we got from the Development Bank of Wales by any means, but because um, that investment is based on us, exploring uh, social enterprise we don't have that guaranteed income um, from day one that we knew we would have with the wind turbine you know you're going to be able to sell energy because everyone wants to keep throwing their lights on you know you're going to get the money back and pay the loan back this smaller pot of social investment from the third, third sector resilience fund is is a bit of more of a risk for us really because whilst we we think we know uh, that these services are needed and these products are going to be popular we've got to explore that so 
in two years time, we hope to have sort of made ourselves a £20,000 profit and pay that, lo that, that loan back and, and also have a sustainable income based on a series of small social, um, social and rural enterprises. Um, just finally then before I finish, one of the things that I think this journey through grant funding to social investment has, has given us is what we'll do is we'll hear from our next hear from a peer speaker and then we'll um, bring everyone back together and we'll pop questions to you together but that was absolutely brilliant and I think it's just great to hear how empowered you feel as an organisation to hear the journey you've been on and to really get a flavour of actually what social investment can allow you to do from a um, a large scale perspective but also from a creative perspective and you talk a lot about community power and well-being and I think that's just a brilliant depiction of what is happening in your local community so thank you so much for that absolutely brilliant um, so I am delighted to welcome our next hear from a peer speaker um, who is joining us from the Hubbard Foundation so we've got Truant Resterick who is the CEO um, and I'm just going to find him on my screen there he is what what a weird world that we live in where we have to find people on screens before we can introduce them and um, so thank you so much Truant for joining our session today over to you Thanks a lot, Emily. And yeah, it's really fascinating hearing the, the other speaker. Um, so I'm just going to give you a very quick introduction to what Hubbub does. Um, and then I'm going to explain how we've used uh, so social investment to help us through through the, the last seven years. And then just to finish off with sort of what we see as the positives uh, of social investment and then some of the perhaps organisational challenges that, that that need to be overcome I think to to, to make it work so um, yeah I set Hubba about seven years ago uh, it's a very belated midlife crisis for myself um, we're an environment charity and our aim is to uh, encourage um, people to live more sustainably in their daily lives um, and we do that by talking about topics which we think people are interested in so the food they eat the clothes they wear the homes they live in and their neighborhoods um, most of our work is done in partnership with big corporates, so we partner with a big company. Uh, we then create change campaigns which are based around great behaviour change techniques and good design, measure absolutely everything we do and then openly share the results, good and bad, so that people can steal the best bits and learn from the many mistakes we make. Um, and the final value we had was we didn't particularly care if nobody had heard of Hubbub at the end of the day, it was, it was the change that was important rather than the organisation. Um, so that was the business plan. Um, much to my wife's fury, we started off with a £25,000 uh, grant from an individual trust, um, which we pretty soon got down to about £500. Um, so it was quite rocky early days. Um, but this year, the seventh year, the turnovers have about four and a half million. Uh, we were lucky enough to be nominated as Charity of the Year this year. Um, and about 95% of our income is from corporates. Um, so we're quite an unusual charity. And we do things like we've got a network of community fridges across the UK, there's over 150 community fridges, which we distribute perishable food to those in need. And that's supported by the co-op. Um, we've also collect up unused smartphones and physically and digitally clean them and then are redistributing them to 10,000 people who are digitally isolated um, with a year's worth of free data, which we do in partnership with um, O2, um, which is uh, sort of attracts, deals with both digital isolation, but also the massive problem of electronic waste in this country. So that's a flavor of what we've done. Uh, and I was counting up how many times we've used social investment in our seven, in our seven years. Uh, it's currently five um, and hopefully next month it will be six um, and we've used it in very different ways and I just wanted to go through each of those different ways we've used it and, and who it came from uh, and what, what the terms of the, the, the payback were. So as I said we started off with no money, uh, we very quickly went to absolutely no money um, but we knew we had a strong concept and a strong set of ideas so we were lucky enough to get a 50,000 investment, social investment from Venturesome. Um, and basically we use that to cash flow the organization through those difficult early months 
uh, where you're out sort of having all those conversations with businesses and other funders that you think might land, um, but, but you haven't got the money to, to cover that development period. So for Venturesome, that was really high risk. Um, I'd, I'd had previous dealings with Venturesome. So it was a higher interest rate, it was over 6% interest rate. Um, and it took an awful lot of persuading my board who just come together uh, to go, oh, blimey, oh, you're going to take on a loan and you haven't really done anything. Um, but without that loan, we wouldn't have got started. So, so that, that was the first uh, social investment we took. Um, and then about sort of two years in, we discovered that some of the things we were developing, actually, we could sell uh, and sort of make a surplus on and also um, and increase our impact. But the charity was very much about innovation and creativity and selling something requires a different set of skills. So we decided to set up a social enterprise owned by the charity. Um, and we secured a 200,000 pound investment from Esme Fairburn, which was solely about getting the social enterprise started, create, getting the team in to do the work, creating the marketing. Um, and basically it was the startup funding for the social enterprise. So they underpinned the, the, that. Um, we had a long payback period on it, but actually we paid them back uh, within three years on the surplus that we made from the social enterprise. Uh, and last year, even during COVID, the social enterprise generated a £200,000 surplus back into the charity. So that gave us unrestricted funding uh, and the social enterprise is sort of continuing to grow and flourish. It's owned by the charity, um, uh, but, but it is a separate entity with its own board of directors and its own man managing directors. So um, that, that, that has a slightly different set of deliverables, which is basically about profit as well as outcome. Um, and then we've taken two, no, three sets of funding uh, for specific projects. So um, the first funding came from uh, Esme Fairburn, and that was to set up a YouTube and vlogging channel. Um, so what we saw was there was a big shift in communications to using a videos um, and, and sort of, and also podcasts. And we knew that if we could set up a channel uh, that, that could get that message across through that route, we'd do two things. One is we'd increase our reach, but secondly, we'd have another product to sell into companies uh, to sort of promote the activities we did. So um, it was quite an interesting conversation with Venturesome who didn't have a clue what vlogging was. So it's a bit of education on their part about what we were trying to do. Um, but they made that investment, um, again, over short term, uh, it, was, it was about £80,000 and we paid that back pretty quickly. Um, and then we went for another social investment of £120,000 from Venturesome for a project called Food Connect, which enabled us to invest in electric cargo bikes and e-vehicles to take food that we knew, perishable food that we knew was being wasted straight to the local community in Milton Keynes. And during the pandemic, uh, where people were really struggling for food, that service just took off. And again, we asked for the investment because we knew if we could prove the concept, businesses would invest in it and they have done. So we've had investment from people like Bosch and Costa. So we've now got a model which we can take out to other parts of the country. Um, and then we had a bigger investment from the Esme Fairburn of £200,000. Um, and that was to underpin a climate change campaign. We were, deli we were delivering in Manchester and again, we knew we could get commercial money, but we knew it was going to take us quite a long time. So what Esme did was, uh, what, yeah, Esme did was that they underpinned that investment so we could get going immediately. And consequently, that built more confidence from corporate partners. So they actually came in quicker. And ironically, it also gave grant funders who tend to be a little bit more conservative the confidence. So we've actually started to attract grant funding from people like Garfield Western, um, and the Waits Enterprise Family Trust. So actually the social investment in that instance generated grant income as well. And we're just talking to Venturesome about another investment, uh, again, to underpin a project which we can commercialize. Um, so that's how we've used it. I think we love social investment. Um, and sometimes we've actually taken social investment, which is more costly when we could have probably funded it ourselves. But the reason we, we've taken the social investment is First of all, it really focuses everybody's mind on profit. So if you know you've got to pay back, you know you've got to generate a surplus, and that's not the case for a lot of grant income. Um, 
you know you've got to hit impact. So with the last ESME Fairburn grant we've taken, the interest rate drops if we hit impact targets. So if we take what we're doing in one city to another city, the interest rate drops. So we actually have a financial incentive to, to both make a surplus and, and generate uh, more impact. Um, it's fantastic having somebody come in from outside the organization to scrutinize what you do. Um, it keeps everybody on their toes. It gives the board actually more confidence that somebody from outside the organization is looking at the finances for the whole organization. And also you can do it really quickly. So a lot of the projects we know we could probably have done, but it would take time to get grant funding in particular, but also commercial funding. So a lot of the social investment people we deal with make quicker decisions. So that's why we like it. And that's why we continue to use it as part of our mix. Um, the difficulties are you've got to have a completely supportive board. Um, if the board doesn't understand it or feels fearful about it, then, then you've got a problem. Um, you've got to understand the risk you're taking because it doesn't look great on the balance sheet uh, necessarily. Uh, and if you don't get a profit, then, then you, you, you could get into sort of some difficulties. Um, and the culture of the organization has got to be right. So people used to working in a grant system, it's a totally different culture working in a social investment uh, system. So people have to be receptive to the fact that they're going to be scrutinized a lot more, that it's no good just doing a project and then writing a nice grant report at the end of it, that there's going to be somebody breathing over their shoulders, probably on a quite regular basis and asking some fairly targeted questions about where's the money going? What's the profit? What's the impact? Um, and, and, you know, culturally that, that can be a bit of a shock sometimes. Um, so Emily, I hope, hope that's okay. That was a, I know I had 10 minutes. So I just, that was a very quick sort of charge through what, what we've done and how we've used social investment. Absolutely. Thank you. And I'm grateful that, um, this session this morning. Um, so we don't have any questions in the chat yet, but sometimes it just takes a little bit of time to get the questions going. Um, but thank you both for your depictions there and also your positivity and really celebrating what social investment has done for both of your organisations as well. Something you both picked up on actually, which I want to start the conversation around, is you both touched upon the importance of having your board on board your social investment journey with you. And that's something we talk to a lot of organizations about. Um, and I think it would just be really useful to talk a little bit about why that is so important, maybe some of the challenges that you might have had um, within that setting. Um, so True, and I'll come to you first if that's okay. Yeah, I mean, it's, I think it's one of the biggest challenges probably for many organizations. Um, so, we deliberately built our board um, around sort of certain skill sets. Uh, and one of the skill sets that we saw in the board was somebody who'd done this sort of thing before, had a bit of a track record of it um, and understood it. Um, and, and that, and, and he's, he's our treasurer. So, um, so he, he actually did a lot of internal persuading um, with, with the trustees because some of them were very, worried because about liabilities obviously um and we also have a very supportive and very entrepreneurial chair person so i've run organizations before where the chair in particular has probably not been so from quite a, on such an entrepreneurial background and i think i'd really struggled with that i think the other advantage that having that person as a treasurer was that the, the first summer money we got from Venturesome was stupidly high risk from their point of view. You know, we were like an unproven startup. Um, and actually Jonathan Katz, who was our treasurer, went in and spoke to, to them. And he went in and spoke to Esme when we took the social enterprise loan. And, and it built confidence on their side as well, that a board member was, you know, able to come in, able to explain it, and also had a track record of proving it. Uh, previously so I think the culture of the board uh, is is essential to, to to make to make this work effectively great and Holly any kind of thoughts or reflections from you there yeah, I mean, interestingly, we, I mean, like I mentioned, we we do have our, our chairman sort of, I would call him a social entrepreneur, although his background has been much more gaining um, 
investment from from local people so sort of through mm-hmm. share offer to purchase assets which is a really really different game to to, to going to a lender um but however i think um he has sort of certainly brought me into that world of just having the confidence of saying you know it's really worth a punt let's let's try and whether you're asking your neighbor or the development bank of wales you still have to have the guts to try um i mean it's been interesting that our board were relatively relaxed about the 1.3 million pounds from from development bank of wales i think that's probably because like i mentioned earlier the wind turbine it was gonna generate energy we know that there's going to be a, a market for energy whereas the the sort of eighty thousand pounds which of, of which only 20 percent is a loan recently from the from the resilience fund we, there was a much longer more torturous conversation amongst the board about like well we're not so sure we'll make that twenty thousand back that we'll be able to pay it back because we haven't got as much of a guaranteed market for the for the sort of enterprising products and services that we're, we're generating Actually, I really valued that. We we have gone for it, and and you know, as a board, we kind of came to an agreement. But it's really good having kind of those pioneering, gutsy, like just take the risk kind of people mixed in with those more tentative, sort of slightly more risk averse people. So we we work great great as a board. Um, it just makes for long committee meetings. <laughs> Great, thank you so much for that. And I'm also going to do a shameless plug to um, Get Informed, which is um, uh, a social investment for boards platform that we have created at Good Finance that offers practical um, support and guidance for organisations who are also looking to take on social investment and have some of those difficult and maybe challenging conversations um, with their board members as well. So I'm just going to do a quick scan and see if um, if we have any questions, anybody wants to come off mute. Um, we can also all just talk rather than popping questions into the chat as well if, if people have um, have any questions uh, there if you want to raise your hands or ask a question. Um, I don't see anything so I might just pop to Ashita um, and, and, uh, and get you to pop your question to Chirin and to Holly. Thank you. Yeah, of course. So the other thing that I um, I wanted to ask for my own curiosity more than anything is that the other thing both of you kind of touched upon and mentioned was that actually the world of social investment is very different um, to the world of grant making. Um, and I'm just curious whether you think taking on social investment has changed or affected the culture or the conversations or the day to day of your organisations. Like, has it has it created any change? And if so, how has that manifested? Shall I go first? <laughs> um, I, I don't think it has because um, for us, because we're quite unusual. So, you know, we, we sort of, our main corporate partners are Ikea, Starbucks, Tesco, who like give us a really hot time, um, to be frank, um, and, and have super high expectations. So for, for, for us, the, the staff always have always been aware that that's, somebody could pick up the phone and have a bit of a go at them at any moment. Um, mm. Uh, so, so, so they've. I think they've understood understood that, and and actually, in sort of the the scheme of things, social investors are a lot nicer. <laughs> um, so, so it's the same sort of culture, but it's not doesn't always have quite such a spiky edge to it. And then grant funders, I think most of them go even further in sort of sort of like the gentle route, um, uh, unless you start to go horribly off course. Um, so, so I don't think it's changed, but I mean, I haven't worked in organisations before which were mainly grant funded. And, and the danger uh, is that, you know, somebody knows that, that they only have to write a report in a year's time or six months time. And, you know, you can, you can get into that sort of exam thing of like, oh, well, I'll do the revision all at the end. Uh, and I think, and this is, might be slightly controversial view, but also grant funding, it's one of those things where at the end of it, you write a report saying we've done brilliantly. The grant funder wants to know that they've invested brilliantly, so they're quite supportive of it. So you sort of get this sort of mutual loving thing going on, which is like, this is a great project, don't we all agree? Yes, we do. Um, and then you move on to the next one. So you don't get that scrutiny and sort of, um, sort of true, honest conversation about, okay, what did go wrong? 
uh, that, that you definitely get with social enterprises and we certainly get with Tesco. So, so yeah, I think that's, that, that's how I see it. I mean, yeah, that's an interesting lesson for us because I think we're much, we're much earlier on in our in our um, experience with investors, and we're looking to, you know, like I was mentioning, maybe sort of looking to corporate investors in the future. And I'm a bit like, oh yeah, it's going to be a really different. It's going to be a big culture shift for us. I mean, I've actually found the social investors, being the Welsh government, who were also our grant funders, it's quite a similar relationship, really. Um, in fact, maybe a little bit more exacting as grant funders than they have been so far as social um, sort of investors but yeah I do I do expect us to have to start um, I think measuring our impact more accurately um, and appropriately in the future I think that's what we are going to have to learn to do better in order to give confidence to uh, to maybe corporate investors as well as sort of bigger social investors in the future. So we're kind of stealing ourselves, as I mentioned, in this kind of period of growth and change to start being a bit more precise and prescribed about how we show the social and environmental impact of our work. But at the moment, it's all relatively comfortable. Grant funding, social investment doesn't feel like much of a difference. That's really, that's really interesting. Um, I have one more question if anyone else wants to go. No, one more. Um, so another question I have is over the past year, obviously there's been so much change and so much adapting for, for so many organizations. Um, what, what was the impact of, your, of the past year like on your relationships with social investors and um, just not just in the context of social investment, but generally what, what would you say your kind of key learnings or reflections or takeaways from the past year? were big question sorry i mean i think for us whilst obviously like any other organization we've there's been an impact of of lockdown and um, you know social restrictions on us we found because we're an environmental focused organization that actually you know that, that environmental degradation hasn't stopped <laughs> in fact it's almost in the last sort of six months become almost that we you know the focus has come back on it again and i feel the welsh government's pretty amazing at that in terms of their policy and their act act action so really we've almost been enabled to grow more in the last year than perhaps you know if, if lockdown hadn't happened because we've been chipping away at that environmental argument while there's been a lot of distraction about covid um, I mean, for, uh, for me, it's the same argument. It's about sort of human well-being as, as much as it is anything else. So it, it's, all, it's almost been a boon to us, this whole, uh, this whole COVID thing, which sometimes sounds awful because I know it's been terrible for so many people. I mean, and, and the, the Third Sector Resilience Fund, which I mentioned, which is the grant loan blend that we have now for developing social enterprises is, I mean, I, as I understand it, resilience fund being sort of born out of the need to support the third sector because of um, the experience of COVID. So again, we feel that we've actually benefited from this in a way that we just wouldn't have if it hadn't actually happened, if this pandemic hadn't happened. So it's kind of a bit perverse, but that's the truth of it. Mm, that's really interesting. Well, I mean, from our viewpoint, so first of all, I think funders have been absolutely amazing through this COVID period. I mean, grant funders have been very, very receptive to shifts in out outcomes and project exchanges. And so many have you know, moved so quickly to make funding available. And I think it proves how quickly things can move if, if they need to, when sometimes they can be a little slower, particularly on the grant side. So, but I think that they, they've been incredible on the social investment side with venturesome so the the food connect project i mentioned which was basically providing electronic vehicles to redistribute food waste creating jobs in the community but also supporting um people who um who really needed that help um, again venturesome moved incredibly fast on that like we got a decision i think within a month um and we've just gone back to them and again they're actually moving fast and we we can they, they said yeah we want to take this to this committee and it's like oh crikey we've got to provide you with three years of funding expectations and, and we couldn't do it quick enough so so they have moved really fast i think the big change that we've seen is you know during the pandemic they were like people making sourdough bread and then they were like over half the population struggling to put food on the table 
Um, and I think, and yeah, at the same time, people wanted access to fresh air. Uh, they got really concerned about things like food waste. And I think what we've seen is that there's been a, a very much needed coming together of the environmental challenges we face and social challenges. So, you know, a lot of what we do in this country is waste resources when people are going without. Um, and it's basically about redistributing and connecting and, and making sure that we get the full value of about everything we're using and supporting those people in the communities who, who are struggling. And I think there has been a coming together of those two agendas, which I think has long been needed. So I think that's, you know, that's, that's been quite positive. Yeah, no, of course, I'm just going to read out a, a comment from Alan in the chat. I think it's really interesting. Um, it says, uh, we designed and delivered the Third Se Sector Resilience Fund on behalf of the Welsh Government's funding response to COVID. Um, Wales has already benefited from a close relationship between the government and the sector through this period. Um, it's a really interesting um, reflection there, um, Alan. And then th there's another question for you as well, is what do you think of, about using pension funds for social investment? Yeah, I, I, it's really... I th I, I know nothing about it, so this is going to be a really uninformed answer. But um, theoretically, I think it it makes would make huge sense. Surely, you know that that you can build in, you know, you can build in a good return. I think you know we, we're paying some some quite hefty interest rates on some of the, the, the loans that, that we've taken. So you can build in that return, but you can also build in that long term resilience, which you know for pension funds in particular the you know, particularly the climate crisis, but also sort of the degradation of nature, you know, that's, they should be thinking about resilience in a broader term in terms of the use of their funds. So um, theoretically, it sounds great. I don't know what the mechanisms are for doing it or how you do it, but, but Sophia, yeah, I think that's a, that's a great, great idea. It's, it's not a great time. <laughs> Thank um, you. <laughs> hugely um educated on either but i've just popped a link into a, into the chat um to a campaign called make my money matter um and the campaign was built around they did a bit of research that that showed overwhelmingly that people in the uk didn't actually know what their pension money was going towards um and it started off sort of as an awareness building piece um and now it's become a campaign about using your your pension with um intention um and they've got kind of a focus on being um net zero as well um so just interesting to check out if you want to find out more about about pensions yeah and of, of course one of the big concerns about pension funds is something called stranded assets isn't it which is that you know a lot of the money is going to sort of fossil fuel intensive businesses which you know could become a stranded asset as we move to net zero and and people expecting a return from their bp or shell shares mm. might get a bit of a shock so in terms of resilience that way as well it, it makes a lot of sense great does that answer your question okay sophia did you have any other kind of comments or thoughts on that um that's great thank you it was a bit of a broad ranging question really <laughs> Um, and, and I don't know that much about it either, but I'm interested to find out more um, from a personal perspective, worried about the implications for my own pension, if, if that's the way money is used. Um, so I think it's about learning more and trying to understand what level of risk is acceptable for that kind of investment. Um, and it's probably going to be a while until that, that those things happen. Um, because we need to embed social investment and give it far more legitimacy than it currently has, I think, in order for big pension schemes like LGPS, for instance, to look at um, this type of investment. And then we go back to the boards and the level of risk and the understanding of social impact investment. I think we've got a long way to go, particularly in local government, to embrace uh, this, this kind of investment um, and to be positive about using it to deliver outcomes. Um, and I think that the historic um, issues around finance and reduced resource and also quite a lot of local authorities have taken big risks with commercial enterprise recently and many of them have failed in those, those enterprises. Um, so that risk aversion has, has risen in a lot of places rather than reduced. Um, and it also puts them in a position of weakness to borrow generally um, let alone with social investment, but from anywhere at all. So, so there's a lot of work to be done in recovery um, and perception of risk before we can mainstream social investment um, with bigger organisations. 
Yeah, great. Thank you so much for that, True. And I don't know if you were you were not nodding along there, so I don't know if you have anything you want to come back well, on. Well, yeah, I think all. all of that is so true, but surely you'd rather have your money in sort of, you know, your community sort of wind turbine than you would in some of the some of the, the risky fossil fuel assets yeah. that we're seeing at the moment. So I completely agree. But I think you, your point about, you know, where local authority have made some investments sort of, and have done so badly with them, I think that that, that risk aversion is, is building and, and the social investment sector has got a lot to do to prove it actually isn't that risky. <laughs> um, and, and there's this perception that it is, but, but I'm sure there's, there's quite a wealth of evidence. I mean, and certainly talking to VentureSome, you know, they, they, I know they have their, their risk register and a lot of that, you know, their risk, they perceive as high risk, but actually the amount of defaults is, is pretty tiny considering where they're investing. Great, thank you so much for that. And I'm just gonna scan the virtual room to see if we've got any final questions for Truett, uh, Truett or Holly from anyone in the um, audience there. I don't think we have, um, but we've covered quite a wide spanning range of issues there. Um, we have gone on this journey where we work with a lot of um, charities and social enterprises, helping them um, take on investment and then we also raise um we, we design funds based on objectives of um the, the organizations we work with uh which we manage ourselves we're fda regulated or um we help partners to deliver investment into their organization separately so um so sort of we act with both hats on both the investment advisory and the fund management um and actually, it's interesting to hear your perspective. We've developed funds around community energy, so um, helping community organisations acquire and develop their own community energy sites, um, and also invested in enterprise in parks and green spaces. Um, and we're recently raising a, um, a marine enterprise fund. Um, but specifically today, I just wanted to talk about some of the sort of conservation investment market and see how that can then be applied to some of the work you're doing. Um, so um, just on the conservation investment side, it's quite a new market. There's just a massive funding gap for nature restoration um, compared to the supply. And there's, overseas, there's a massive development of this um, conservation investment market. But in the UK, it's still quite early stage. So a lot of the work, there's now quite a lot of funding coming out, taking some of the learnings from the social investment market putting in grant funding to develop investment readiness and, and investable project, projects and investment cases that can attract private investment. Um, and really, this is around... Um, I don't go into this. Um, so how this works is the types of conservation investment markets that are out there is really um, where you can identify um, revenue streams for nature um, and and there's a, basically nature provides loads of different outcomes and benefits. Um, but at the moment, um, they're often just valued from an economic basis, but not actually from an investor. So, but there are various sort of new markets that are being developed, which basically are enabling investment to be brought in. Um, and so I've just put some of these examples of really how the market's developing. And I think a lot of you are sitting more on the sort of right hand side, which you see more developed around um, enterprises and renewable energy and um, uh, cafes and parks that also support sort of the wider environment and surpluses can be recycled, but all the way down to actual um, the e ecosystem services that are provided by the environment, um, which basically is requiring sort of um, standards and monitoring and recognition of the benefits by the investor. But already we're really seeing a lot of movement around um, the carbon market. So where uh, projects can develop, to, can, um, can deliver uh, verifiable carbon outcomes and this is from initially woodland but we're helping um, charities look at how their sort of grassland or peatland um, restoration activities can support investment into those habitats and then also a market around biodiversity so where um, activities measurably improve biodiversity the ability to bring in funding based on new policies coming through through the government 
So there's a lot of a point around advocacy for the need for good regulation and bringing in, um, enabling these new income streams to, to be developed. Um, so some of the key elements that are required in this sort of conservation investment market are very similar around the need for a revenue alongside that measurable environmental impact. And there are often a lot of other barriers in this market which really sort of working through around uh, the number of stakeholders involved, the need to find buyers for these outcomes and identify the right revenue streams to then enable investment to be brought in, as well as the sort of government policy and the um, technical assistance funding and all the other the elements that have come together in the social investment market, helping it to develop um, and wider market conditions. Um, just to bring this to life of how it's worked and what we've done in terms of delivery. So a specific example here is working with the RSPB um, around their objective to protect a really important bird species in Devon. Um, and basically the issue was, is that um, there'd been a massive decline of this bird and um, and there was basically development taking place that was sort of leading to this this bird dying out, um, which but they had to mitigate for what their impact was, but not until after um, they'd sold the development and it was only through like minimal income streams. So we helped RSPB bringing a um, commercial loan uh, just from Lloyd's Bank into acquiring a piece of land, restoring it for the habitat and enabling a long term income with the landowner. Um, based on the future projections of potential payments from the the housing development. So by the end of the the loan, they will own the land directly. They'll have an ongoing management uh, um, income stream for the landowner and the bird species being protected and they're enabling scale up to wider habitats across the area. Um, So these are the kind of sort of investments in the conservation world that um, are starting to come out and there's now lots of policy which is enabling um, hopefully further restoration across wider places. Um, The way we're now looking to sort of scale this up and it'd be interesting to see how this applies um, is for example things like we've worked on the creation of an environment fund um, in Greater Manchester Um, and this is really a way in which um, the the sort of market is looking to align philanthropic and public funding and sort of take off the pressure off NGOs from specific funding bids for enabling collaboration and then using some of that to support the development of investable projects. So, so far, this fund has sort of enabled 11 NGO partners to deliver projects across through um, DEFRA funding and corporate funding. And we're now we're working to develop um, an invest, investment opportunities and investment funds that can invest across um, key natural habitats, so including the amazing um, degraded peatland across the city region that currently just doesn't have the levels of funding and there's all this sort of competition with agriculture, but through looking and forecasting the carbon potential and the verification options that can be delivered, as well as the biodiversity enhancement revenues, um, the, the, the opportunity to bring in that investment to enable acquisition and restoration, similar to what's been um, that what I talked to in the previous example, and then bring that across the wider city region is the kind of things that um, we're looking to develop in the market um, and, and is already being implemented. But I know we were talking about of a place-based sort of city livable region opportunity. And I think through this, um other other funds like the um enterprise investment and things brought in under an umbrella that's looking across the priorities and gov- and and objectives across the region um is quite an interesting approach um so um as i said it's still a bit of an earlier stage market compared to social investment um and really what we're trying to do is sort of bring it on to where some of you guys have got to around investment readiness And a lot of the work at the moment required is around that kind of technical proving of actually the evidence around the conservation outcomes and how they can actually be measured and and show that the financial benefit is being delivered to the beneficiary. Um, And then monetization around the cash flows that have been developed. So that's the sort of thing around those carbon markets and, and biodiversity, as well as 
water quality and other interventions that can and are starting to be recognized by utilities and insurance providers as ways in which they can pay for the outcomes for what they're what they're delivering um so so yeah th- th- this is where we're going and great to i would great to hear if any of this is sort of applied to some of the work that you're doing uh, either, even if it's sort of environmental enterprise focus but moving on to where conservation can fit in alongside that um hopefully you could hear that <laughs> Thank you so much for that, Alessia. And yes, we, we could hear you. Um, thank you so much for navigating through those tech challenges there. Um, but we could hear you perfectly. So thank you so much for that. I'm just going to do another quick scan of the room, see if we have any questions. That was really interesting and insightful. And I guess just great to hear from your perspective of how um, so much of the work that you're doing at Finance Earth could potentially be very relevant to the organisations on this call, looking at um, both some really interesting examples there of some of the work that you're doing from a conservation perspective but also some regional work that you're undertaking as well so we don't have any questions in the uh, chat there but I'm keen if anyone wants to come off mute um, and pop a question to Alicia that would be um, great Don't see any questions there, um, but that's that's all absolutely grand. Um, I think one of the key things to say as well is that um, we know one of the good things about a Let's Talk with Finance session is that we're all about making connections. So if this has even sparked a train of thought or an idea or something that you would like to discuss in more detail, and um, we will be sharing everyone's uh, uh, connections after the event as well. So um, if there's no um, specific questions from uh, the the audience, which I don't think there is. Um, I think that's all good. Um, I think, um, oh, Sophia's popped a question there in the chat. Always good to get the, the conversation going. So I think something you picked on that, Alicia, which was really um, important is, um, so considering the limited resource local authorities have in parks and open spaces, how do you think they'll be able to navigate the biodiversity net gain policy? So a great question from Sophia there. Yeah, no, this is um, definitely one of the sort of issues that we're seeing um, with working with local authorities, both across Manchester and um, Cambridge and as well as in county, county-wide. And I think one of the... Um, opportunities with policy coming through is providing that certainty um, and where investment can play a role then is really instead of that sort of piecemeal administration and the difficulty of actually kind of delivering actual really good quality habitats and just sort of um, there's a real opportunity to sort of basically look at where the key um, opportunities are in the area things like uh, through that sort of Greater Manchester Environment Fund approach, that's basically allowing organisations to come together, work out what the priorities are, present them, and then bring in investment, social investment into that. So you're not just waiting for bits and bobs of um, funding to come through that doesn't achieve the impact and ecological networks and nature recovery networks that are all being developed across the UK. So I think it's a mixture of um, policy coming in, providing that kind of funding and um, resource support for the local authorities, but as well as where investment fits in to help alongside that. Thank you. Can I just ask, are you finding that a lot of the local authorities that you're working with have all got their um, biodiversity opportunity mapping in place? Not um, in general. Some of them are looking at that, but it, it's in general the, the local NGOs are sort of helping them with that. Um, and where the um, local authority is more engaged in this, um, then they can start sort of moving and they get more interested, I think, if it's looking at some of their their important land areas. So working with the local authority to look at where the, the basically their priorities then align with nature recovery network areas um, has definitely been a key way of kind of moving them forward and getting um, policies and putting them into their local plan. Um, so, so yeah, there's been a bit of a mixture, but um, sort of showing them the opportunities basically start to get them thinking in that way. Great, thank you. Great, thank you. Ashita, you've come off mute. I don't know if you had a particular thought or question that you'd like to put to Alicia. 
No, I was just um, listening to the conversation and learning about biodiversity. It's not something that I think about much day to day, but it's always interesting with um, social investment. It's just like the number of sectors and spaces that, that, it's, um, that it becomes relevant in. It's really interesting. Absolutely. Great. Okay, um, so I can't see any more questions in the chat box there. Um, but just to say a, again, a massive virtual thank you to you, Alicia, for coming along and for joining this session today. It's been great to hear from you. And if it's okay, um, I will share your slides with um, the attendees on this call, just to take um, a quick scan through that. There was lots of great information on there. And sometimes it's just good to digest that and maybe have some follow-up questions as well after the session. So thank you so much for your time. It was great greatly appreciated yeah thank you thank you everyone as well if you want to read more about um any of these so yeah the first one up is in port patrick um, harbour so this is a very historic harbour um, and uh in individuals in the local area invested using community shares and they raised a hundred thousand pounds um, urban bike parks. So this is based in Leeds and social capital, uh, sporting capital, sorry, provided a hundred thousand pounds loan to support the development of their business model. Um, and they moved from being sort of volunteer led to having a, a paid staff. In solar energy, we've got South Mead uh, Development Trust. So they took on a secured loan. Um, uh, which uh, enables them to get solar panels and, and reduce their overheads. I think that takes us back to the beginning. Um, so I'll just pop some links in, into the chat if you want to read more about any of those organisations. But we just wanted to give you a couple of different examples um, of the ways that organisations have used social investment and the different types of social investment that are out there. Um, and something that you'll have heard us talk about lots of different types of social investment today from kind of community shares or blended which is a combination of gone and known um, and what I'd really recommend doing is just jumping onto the Good Finance website where there's loads of different um, tools and, and um, information on, on trying to work out what all the different types are and if they might be right for you. Um, so there's a diagnostic tool on the website and it's a two three minute quiz that just helps you see um, whether social investment could be right for you and if so which type of social investment um, and there's also loads of other um, uh, social investment case studies and stories on there as well of how organisations have, have used it. Great. Let me just pop the link in the chat there. Yeah, so I think that, that was the final thing for me and I think Emily's going to wrap up, um, well, not wrap up just yet, but do, do the Mentimeter to, to see, um, yeah, if anyone's feeling more equipped and informed about social investment now. Thank you, Ashita. And yeah, like Ashita said, there's some fantastic examples of organisations who are doing some great stuff across the environmental sector on the Good Finance website. And we've also created a, um, a short case study pack that includes all the organisations that were just included in that short um, graphic. Um, and we will share that with all attendees after the session. It's just to show that whilst we have talked about particular parts of the environmental sector today, there is so much happening within this space to make places live and exciting across the UK as well. So finally, um, before we come on to optional networking, um, I would like to do another Mentimeter Sense check with you and just find out um, if you are feeling that your knowledge has been improved um, after uh, our session today. So if you pop back onto menti.com and type in the code um, 18440528, which I'll pop in the chat, it would just be fantastic to get a sense from you if your knowledge has expanded or grown throughout this session today. We're not expecting anyone to become experts within the short two hour session, but it's just great for us to know um, if we have provided some tools, resources, hints and tricks, uh, hints and tips to help you navigate what is quite a complex world. And um, so yeah, I've just shared the codes there in the chat. Um, and I will share my screen so we can see if our knowledge has grown throughout the session.
So we were on a five before and we are up to a seven now, which is fantastic. And there's always room to learn and to grow more. And we really hope throughout the work that we're doing with the Real Ideas organisation, this is just the beginning of a conversation around how social investment could be used in your organisation. We'll do some follow up with you all um, and we will keep in touch. Um, and one of the best ways that you can find out more about the work of Good Finance is to sign up to our newsletter. And um, so I'll share a link to that within the follow up email as well well and um, we are working with the Real IDs organization on this event but we're also hoping to continue our partnership so this is not going to be the first um, of, of of our engagement sessions together and we have been working with them for a number of years and um, so thank you um, to the Real IDs organization for co-hosting this session with us so we are sitting at a 7.4 in terms of um, our knowledge as a group, which is brilliant that we have um, popped up uh, some of the learning skills from a 5 to a 7.4, which is which is really fantastic to hear. Um, and we hope that that will continue to grow. Um, and we hope that throughout this session today, you have a, have learned or been inspired by our brilliant here from a peer speakers, Truen and Holly. And you've had some great insight from Alicia there as to, from a social investment perspective, how at Finance Earth, they are growing, scaling and, and um, expanding some of their work around conservation and regional uh, environmental investment ideas too. Great, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I'm pretty sure everyone is, uh, is quite sick of having stuff thrown at them today. And there's always lots of information, there's always lots of um, slides and information to get through. So I'm really just keen to open up the floor and to have a discussion with anyone on this call who would like to ask any questions or just stick around and have a bit more of an informal discussion. But finally, just to say thank you so much to Ashita um, for uh, your wonderful work um, on the call today and say uh, thank you to the Real Ideas organisation, to, so to Deshni there. Um, it's been great to host this session with you and with Lindsay. And again, finally, thank you to everyone who joined this session um, on a Friday uh, morning. It's been really